so one of the ways that I like to look at, at domestic violence is that for every reason to leave, there's often an equal and pre more pressing reason to stay. And it's all about how do we help remove the barriers so the person can flee. So versus putting the onus on them of like, why are they staying? Let's look at what do we need to remove for them to feel that they can flee. And to know that like when that happens, that that's the most dangerous time for them. It's interesting when you say removing the barriers because I, I think in my experience, it the judgment is really hard for people to put down. Mm -hmm. Um, what would you say to someone who just finds themselves stuck in the judgment? And to that point also, um, I feel like in my lived experience, people see more than they're willing to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. would we press the person who says, I didn't know a little mm -hmm. bit more to say, mm -hmm. okay, so given that this is the unfortunate tragic end to this particular incident, here are things that you might keep in mind. I feel like in the human trafficking space, we've been doing a really good job of saying, these are the things you should look out for. This is what you should pay attention to. What are those things in the domestic violence space as far as like people saying, well, it was hidden. Cause you know, I do know on some levels that some of this is really, really hidden, but mm -hmm. there are personality traits that change. There are all kinds of things that you could kind of see that might be an indication of things that are happening outside of the poster with the black eye kind of experience, right? So. The first thing is, how do you, you know, this is two Harvard Divinity School people thinking, <laughs> like, how do we dismantle the judgment? You know, like the, <laughs> the sort of black Christian informed me mm -hmm. and the Buddhist informed you, by the way, got lots of Buddhist tendencies. I don't know if you see that behind <laughs> yeah, me. I, I got my little, my little Reiki stuff going on. I keep a positive meditation. Like it's all mixed up in there, even though it's like the black girl from Baltimore Christian thing. But it, it's to me, you know, I have my own personal experience of having a huge impasse and having to give up like structural things for me that were huge. Mm -hmm. And I knew the horror of people who were close to me, who saw me in a certain way in the public and all of these things. And then all of a sudden it's like, she's not that person anymore. And mm -hmm. the judgment was like intense. I had different skill sets though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what do you say to normal people who are in the echo chamber, who are red state, blue state, constantly like, you know, provoked by stuff to just be like, okay, you know, how do you do this? My tactic is, if this were you, how would you want somebody to handle you? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. To do like the radical empathy where you kind of put yourself literally in the body, not the shoes, because you know, you can kick off the shoes, <laughs> but in the body of the other person, like, you know, knowing that that's somebody's husband or the father of their child or whatever, how would you do that? So anyway, I just, I, I kind of, gave a little bit more than I needed to, but you get my point. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I think it just, it starts by, if you, you know, like what you were starting to share about, you start to notice when people near you, when their patterns of behavior are shifting, you know, it could be something as innocuous as they are always canceling appointments or offhanded comments they might make like, oh, my partner doesn't like, let me buy groceries there. So anything that you start to notice, there are like, maybe they're not red flags, maybe they're like yellow flags and in what your friends and family members might be sharing and any like off behaviors. I think that that's a good sign and it may be or a good indicator and worthwhile to say to the person, hey, just wanted to check up on you, see how you're doing kind of just some open questions so that if they felt comfortable sharing, they would know that you would be that person that they could go to. I, yeah, and I think there's something about like a radical presence that mm -hmm. we kind of don't have with each other anymore, right? Where mm -hmm. it's like, I'm with you, I'm talking to you, but I'm texting and I'm looking at all this stuff and I'm just like, I'm not present to you. I'm not connecting with you in that way um, where that could be um, a little dangerous. So how do you, suggest to people to kind of get over the unintentional, unintentional harm. So when you're talking to people in that space and they're like, I didn't see it. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of guilt and shame that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. um, what are ways in which you kind of empower them to transmute that into something else? Wow. I hadn't thought about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a I'm great... known for these questions. This is great to know. <laughs> um, well, 
I was think, sort of kind of to, to go back on why I think that it's hard for bystanders, right? And hard, hard for family members. And I think some of it is, it can kind of come down to a boundary issue, right? Like it is hard when someone near us is going through something like this. And I think it's natural for people to feel frustrated and upset, you know? So without like, judging oneself to just acknowledge that that's the experience that they're having and to set better boundaries internally. So to say like, okay, my role right now is just to be the compassionate place for this person to go. It's not my job to solve their problem, extract them, build their lives back. That's their work to do. And I'm going to support that work by maintaining my compassion. And when I can't, when I need to refuel myself, I need to pull back a little bit so that I can go back in a better way. So I would say that when I think about what's hard for the care that other people in their lives, it's, it's that it's like wanting to do too much. And also just reframing that the survivor is the expert in their experience. They've been the ones surviving the situation and things that might not even seem like obvious abuse tactics to us, the survivor has lived that experience and knows like the tailor-made abuse that they're experiencing. Um, I think that that's a principle too that's helpful for advocates actually, because advocates can feel defeated. Like why didn't I fix this, single-handedly fix this situation? And it's like remembering the empowerment, remembering the, the strength that the survivor has to get through the situation. I think for people that maybe they didn't see it and they're surprised, I, um, gosh, I don't know this, maybe the divinity school part in me would be, <laughs> I would say to try to not blame yourself, like start there um, and try to forgive yourself for that. And then to try to when you're ready, maybe not immediately, but when you're ready, find some way that would be meaningful to you to give back. I love that answer, thank you.